Recent international news raises questions about how journalists should cover war zones or rebellions. In March, four New York Times journalists were captured by Gaddafi loyalists, subjected to physical abuse and threats, before they were finally handed over to government forces and released. The four had entered Libya illegally and without visas. The four journalists have a history of international capture. According to their New York Times article, the journalists are Anthony Shadid, the Times' Beirut bureau chief and a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, two photographers, Tyler Hicks and Lindsay Adario, who have extensive experience in war zones, and a reporter and videographer, Stephen Farrell, who in 2009 was captured by the Taliban in Afghanistan and eventually rescued by British commandos. The four wrote a report about the terror they experienced during their ordeal. At one point, they were threatened and told that no one would ever find them because they didn't have visas. And while no one deserves to be abused, could the reporters have done more to avoid it by entering the country with visas? In the report, the team, which was released after their ordeal, the team said no article was worth the potential loss of life. In fact, to get that single article, they were captured, beaten, groped, threatened, all for the sake of covering one story. In light of the report about a female reporter who was raped in Egypt, what precautions could be taken when covering international riots? In the case of the Libyan report, Adario, the only woman of the group, was groped several times during their ordeal. Now this could have been much worse. Journalists should have paid bodyguards and translators that are employed by their country of origin, not by the country they're covering. But the danger aside, we cannot underestimate the importance of the media. Another Libyan woman claimed rape at the hands of Gaddafi forces. Instead of going to her own police or her country, she sought the media, the international media that was residing in Libya at the time, because the media is the, are the most powerful tools for relaying information. Now, despite yelling her story to a room full of journalists, she was just released today. Gaddafi's own forces tried to discredit her, calling her an alcoholic, a prostitute, and a liar. Still, even knowing that she could be shamed publicly, she spoke out. The abuse of journalists and of the Libyan people shows how much media are feared in countries that lack equal rights. As morally ambiguous as it is for journalists to enter countries illegally, they have a duty to cover the news wherever it happens and in the face of whomever tries to obstruct, obstruct that coverage. The issue we face is that journalists don't tell the story, no one will. Many journalists have died covering war zones and devastating events, but without their work, we would never know what is going on in other countries. Journalists strive to be ethical profession, and the New York Times journalists and their editors violated ethics by legally sending them into a country, but they had a story to tell. While it's not a good idea to make a habit of measuring ambiguous actions, like illegally entering a country, against the evil of declaring war against your own citizens, their illegal entry may have drawn attention to a bigger problem. While each country has different views on the role of media, from propaganda machine to informant, the power and obligation the media have means that journalists are at worst a necessary evil and at best bringers of truth.